During the Vietnam War, the Viet Cong emerged as a formidable and unyielding enemy to the United States military. This conflict, marred by deep-seated controversy and strife, was characterized by not just physical confrontations, but also intense psychological battles. The Viet Cong, shrouded in secrecy and known for their brutal tactics, exposed American soldiers to warfare that transcended traditional boundaries. Their strategies ranged from psychological operations, designed to demoralize and break the spirit of U.S. troops, to extreme physical torture methods, testing the limits of human endurance. The dense jungles of Vietnam transformed into a terrifying maze, a place of fear and uncertainty, where standard combat rules were abandoned out of sheer necessity and survival. Captured soldiers faced a grim fate, often held in primitive, hidden camps where they endured harsh treatment and indescribable hardships. From the turn of 1965 into 1966, Ho Chi Minh would change the entire complexion of the war. Witnessing that the Americans had superior and seemingly endless firepower, battle strategy and tactics became seminal in the war. For the war in South Vietnam to be won, the Viet Cong would no longer seek pitched battles with the American forces. The only time this would happen would be if the odds were favorable to the Viet Cong. Ambushes, hit-and-run attacks became the order of the day. As American forces built up, the Viet Cong recruitment would also step up the recruitment of North Vietnamese Army soldiers. The Viet Cong infantry, starting with local guerrillas, were afforded only the most basic of training, and all were laced with political teachings. In the majority, the Vietnam force was armed with Chinese renditions of the AK-47, but also a selection of Soviet and Chinese machine guns. However, it wouldn't be gunfire and ammunition that would have the most impact on the U.S. soldiers. Incredibly, the most notorious Viet Cong weaponry was homemade in the villages around the country. Booby traps and landmines could be constructed out of previously used wire and discarded tin cans, but they were devilishly effective. Around 11% of fatalities and 17% of injuries were caused by such traps. None was more infamous than the Punji Stake, a pit of sharpened stakes covered in excrement hidden underground. These guerrilla methods of taking the warfare out of the U.S. playbook with unconventional methods brought significant casualties. Yet equally important, it was psychologically unsettling for the U.S. soldiers and bred a sense of constant danger. Impossible Enemy – A Fight with Ghosts The official name for the Viet Cong was the National Liberation Front, and their movements have often been characterized as ghostly. There was no official headquarters to be found, there wasn't even a hotbed of activity, a particular spot where U.S. intelligence could identify the majority of its leaders or officials. Decisions over meetings for the Viet Cong would be conducted in code, by word of mouth, and they would rarely meet in the same place twice. It should be stated that the NLF had no uniform or insignia. There was nothing to visually identify them as separate from the rest of the civilian population. This would only contribute to a prevailing sense of paranoia and fear among the U.S. personnel. They were in a fight with ghosts. Yet it was also the Viet Cong's capacity for movement, transportation, and surprise attacks that made them ghost-like. The American forces' arrival meant spotter planes were surveilling the landscape, and any sort of base area needed protecting. Remote forests and swamps were the initial choices. But then the Vietnamese came up with a game-changing choice. A network of labyrinthine underground tunnels was built the length and breadth of the country. These tunnels were not to be used as places purely for retreat or shelter, they were to be used as a weapon of war. Viet Cong troops could be provided continuous support above the ground from the tunnels below. Extensive tunnels meant the entire complexion of war was changed, and the nature of territory gained or lost radically altered. Should the U.S. forces manage to capture a village, there could be Viet Cong in tunnels preparing and ready to strike with counteroffensive operations. Just how vast these tunnels were and their efficacy cannot be understated. It is understood that each villager of the NLF would dig three feet of tunnel per day. Only 20 miles from Saigon lay the Chu Chi base of tunnels, a staggering 200 miles of underground tunnels, diverse and indecipherable to anyone but the NLF. Yet what was containing within these tunnels was nothing short of astonishing. Chambers for arms factories, water supplies, a hospital wing, sleeping chambers and kitchens that would disperse their smoke miles away. These were the makings of turning the U.S. enemies into elusive, unreachable ghosts. Not only did this affect the U.S. soldiers psychologically, it rendered conventional war strategies ineffective. Psychological Trauma, Scarring and Warfare 
psychological warfare was arguably the main theme of the entire conflict. Not only were U.S. forces taking on a battle played out far from traditional Anglo-Western strategy, but the enemy was unique, invisible to elusive, undiscernible from an innocent and perhaps most disturbingly, utterly deadly when not even present. It's arguable no element held more psychological weight than the booby-trapped landscape. U.S. personnel could find themselves maimed or killed without ever setting eyes on an NLF soldier. This remote deadliness fed the antipathy and escalating drug use of personnel across the conflict. Yet the NLF did have their own propaganda, and this was produced during the active conflict. It would underline some of the very fears U.S. troops faced day in and day out. Numerous visually striking posters, featuring the national symbol of the lotus flower, were put up across the country. Typically, themes would include shooting down American aircraft and the face of Ho Chi Minh. All would feature bright colors and vivid images, and so often would depict Vietnamese armed and ready for conflict. To the woe of the American troops, the Vietnamese in these propaganda posters were indistinguishable from an everyday civilian villager, much like their Viet Cong enemies. In this conflict against ghosts, with the threat of injury at any given step, U.S. soldiers had another fear that could keep them wide awake and riddled with anxiety, the fear of capture by the NLF. The Viet Cong developed a fearsome reputation for the harsh and unrelenting brutality they could bring to captured U.S. soldiers who became their prisoners of war. The Belly of the Beast There was seldom a fate worse than being a captured American by Vietnamese forces. The North Vietnamese were able to justify their brutality upon prisoners because a war had not been declared. The captured Americans were seen as invading outlaws. Physical punishment was commonplace and used as a way to gain military information or confess to war crimes. These physical punishments included bounding POWs' legs or arms with rope to the point of dislocating them. American POWs in Vietnam could have their feet in iron stocks for weeks on end. The extent of beatings was extraordinary. It would not be uncommon for a POW to be beaten to the extent it cost their life. John McCain, arguably the most famous of American POWs from the Vietnam War, would endure five years as a prisoner of war. Surviving a plane crash, McCain was taken for treatment by North Vietnamese surgeons who left his leg with nerve damage. Following his partial recovery, McCain was subject to physical punishment every two hours for four whole days, which left his left arm broken and ribs cracked. McCain would eventually give a confession at the point of suicide and would somehow go on to survive the ordeal and return to the States. In the years following, during his political campaign, it was visible the damage his time as a POW had left on McCain. He could be seen with a limp in his walk from the inadequate surgery, and he could not lift his arms above his head from his ordeal. Treatment of POWs by the Vietnamese was not only a matter of physical severity, but psychological and nutritional. Lectures and Radio Hanoi broadcasts would be played during beatings in the hope of enforcing communist indoctrination on the prisoners. Commonly, this would take place in a far from clean environment. A lack of medical treatment and filthy environments promoted disease and the presence of rats and insects. Purposeful manipulation of nutrition was also commonplace. Prisoners would be given a limited amount of cabbage or pumpkin soup, a small portion of bread or rice, and typically rotten meat. When it was hot in the summer, there would be no ventilation and only hot food served. When it was cold in the winter, there was no warm clothing and cold food was served. Prisoners inevitably developed skin sores and diseases as a result. One of the most uproarious instances of U.S. POWs being exploited at the hands of their Vietnamese captors was the Hanoi March. In July 1966, U.S. POWs were purposefully led through the streets of Hanoi in handcuffs as a means of riling up the general public. It was only successful, and the march turned violent with many angry Vietnamese citizens attacking the POWs to the point where both guards and prisoners had to fight for their safety. Among the notable POW camps run by the Viet Cong were Alcatraz, Briar Patch, Farnsworth, and Skid Row. These would operate from the mid-1960s to the early 1970s. The most infamous of them were Hoa Lo Prison, known as the Hanoi Hilton, and the Plantation, which was set up as a Potemkin village. This is History on Fleet, and we'll see you next time.